just seeing an image of a uh, Maldivian president wearing mm. India out t-shirt. Now turn the table. Imagine our PM is wearing a t-shirt says Maldives out. Mm. Would any self-respecting Maldivian come and spend their money in this country? have multiple failures in the past but people will only and only recognize you for your last success i believe that a lot of intra city travel will go away in next 10 years in the sense where it's not going to be the primary mode is not going to be the vehicle the primary mode is going to be air taxis sulking a lot around the mistakes which you have made mm. you know just regretting those decisions you are who you are because of all the accumulation of your mistakes welcome to a brand new episode of i did it my way my guest on the podcast today is prashant pitti he's the co-founder of ease my trip a company that is one of the few bootstrapped startups in india he started way back in 2008 and from being a bootstrapped startup founder he's now running a business that has gross booking revenues of almost 8000 crores per annum so we are here to understand his story prashant thank you so much for joining me no pleasure is all mine sonia The setup looks amazing, and you know we talk almost every quarter, right, about earnings, etc. But I'm not here to talk about that today. I want to talk more about you and the your story, basically mm-hmm. the success story that we've seen with Ease My Trip. Mm-hmm. So tell us from the start how it all began and how did you come up with this idea? Oh uh, well, Sonia, to to start from the beginning, we'll have to start from the start of the time <laughs> because everything adds up. Uh, but yeah, I graduated from IIT Madras. Uh, worked in US for about four years. Uh, my two younger brothers, much much more brilliant than I am, they actually started Ease My Trip. And even before they started Ease My Trip, uh, they actually started a mom and pop travel agency called as Duke Travel Agency. Okay. Uh, and that's what we felt like we should do at that moment. Uh, while they were actually in college in a school. and uh, i was working in the us for a couple of banks at that so moment. this was in 2008 no the the duke travel agency started in year 2005 okay and what uh, was the problem you guys were trying to solve uh, there was not big of a problem which we were trying to solve it's just that too many airlines were coming at that time and hence uh, people were discovering flying for the very first time and hence we thought that you know this could be a good way to enter in a new industry and earn some pocket money at least from my <laughs> brother's perspective so you guys were a b2b company initially and from then from 2005 to 2008 we were a travel agency okay and then we understood the pain points of a travel agent and then we became a software for travel agents from 2008 ease my trip began and from 2008 till 2011 ease my trip was basically a software uh, to travel agents and from 2011 onwards we basically became uh OTA as as you know of right now okay so what did uh, how did you think of that switch from being purely a b2c company to becoming uh, from being a b2b company to becoming mm. a b2c company what was that switch like <laughs> well uh, as they say necessity is the mother of all inventions uh it probably was very true for us as well at that moment uh as a software for travel agents we realized that there is no money to be made uh we were purely hand to mouth company at that moment and then also uh as a as an entrepreneur our job is to see 10 years ahead of time and it was very evident that uh in the due course of time everybody is going to just move online and travel agent themselves will become you know redundant and hence uh you know providing a software to an industry where the industry may itself not exist 10 15 years ahead of the time didn't make so much sense and especially since uh it was a lot of uh you know hard work and a lot of uh, you know difficult times uh, oh. to sell software to travel agents uh, nonetheless we were doing okay but seeing 10 years ahead we couldn't keep ourselves to continue doing that and we decided to become a consumer facing company in year 2011 so you said you were working for a bank and your brothers had started this business uh, but how was your childhood like i mean what kind of background did you come from and was there any kind of entrepreneurial spirit that was fed into all three of you oh yes uh, Uh, our father has always been coal trader uh, we all grew up in one bedroom apartment um, small cozy beautiful bedroom apartment and um, where was this this was in delhi uh, we grew up in delhi so all three of us were very uh, thick and close uh, the reason is that there is barely any difference in age between us we all are one and a half years apart okay so hence uh, we didn't need any external friends uh, to say this is we we were just playing amongst ourselves most of the time so very close to each other and uh, you know uh, i have been 
uh, since my sixth grade, I have been my father's accountant. So I know how to write ledgers. I know how to do financing a bit. And uh, I know, I knew since I was my dad's accountant, I knew which months we should ask for, uh, you know, cycle or or PlayStations uh, things uh, and which months we shouldn't ask because uh, they would be months where he would be losing money and there'd be months where he would be making money. So, so the entrepreneurship journey, I'm sure it wasn't an easy one. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that thought come up? I mean, you told me about the problems that you guys were trying to solve mm -hmm. in the travel industry, but it must have been a big risk, right, to leave your job in a bank and to uh, sort of get into this full time. I think, of course, uh, it was actually very well-paying, cushy job. That was just after my graduation from IIT Madras. Uh, and uh, I, I was over there in the US for about three and a half years to be precise. Uh, but I always knew that I had to come back. I never applied for my green card. I uh, never even thought of renewing my H-1B visa. Why is that? Uh, I have been a very big uh, proponent uh, during my IIT times uh, to be an entrepreneur. I've been telling all my friends uh, my college friends that why why should we go abroad? I went abroad. That's a separate story. <laughs> but I've been telling everyone that we should we should be in India. We should create jobs in India, and that's what uh, is expected out of us uh, from everyone. So, in fact, at the first place, I didn't even wanted to apply for the job which I got through. But then everybody said that you know, out of 3,000 students from all IIT and IIM, they barely take four or five. So what are your odds anyways? Mm. So you might as well at least see the, you know, interview process. Mm. And that's how I went. And honestly speaking, I think the reason why I got that job was also because I didn't care about it. I went through about 20 odd rounds of interviews and uh, I was just very nonchalant about it. And that's how I got the job, I guess. So you, uh, I mean, your success story is remarkable. You're one of the three companies that is a bootstrapped startup uh, in India, right? After I think Zerodha, Zoho and Ease My Trip, never raised money and gone to become a company that now has 9,000 crores of almost 8, eight 9,000 crores of gross booking revenues. Mm -hmm. So that's a remarkable milestone. I mean, um, it's, it's very difficult to say how this has happened over the period of time. It is a 15 year long journey. Yeah. Uh, so... To pinpoint any particular moment where we could see this happen uh, was very difficult. Uh, it's just that a lot of accumulation of decisions which worked in our favor uh, made this happen. Uh, a lot of decisions happened. A lot of wrong decisions also happened in the, in, in, in the middle of it. But a uh, few key decisions uh, you know, made this happen where we continue to grow our company without ever raising any money. While we had eight competitors who all had raised tons of money. And and yet, Isma Trip became the second largest travel portal. As so between speak. the three of you, among the three brothers, who is the risk taker? Who is the you know <laughs> brain behind all the decisions? Tell us a little more about that. Clearly, I was not. Um, in fact, I I'll tell you one of the biggest learnings I had when I came back to India in year two thousand and nine. Uh, I mean, as as a student who got into IIT, I thought that I had become a lot of risk averse person. You know, since you study so much to ensure that you get into IIT, and hence to have a cushy life afterwards, uh, I I actually became a lot risk averse. And I think that's a common thread which I can see for a lot of students who go, who get into IIT and IIM. So at Eastmatter, we actually don't have anybody from IIT and IIM except for myself. Uh, we usually hire people from either BIDs or NITs, which I believe are truly talented people. They just, they, they're a lot risk taking people because they didn't really care so much about getting into IIT and hence didn't study so much harder, yet they're talented because they got into NITs and BITs or the other institute. So that's one learning which I have for myself. And in the initial few years, I was actually grappling a lot with almost every time being stuck in analysis paralysis situation, yeah. where I, I know that I haven't really exactly known, should I take this decision or not? Uh, but I just would delay taking decisions for a really long time. And that is where I had to deconstruct myself and uh, learn to be okay to take decisions even if uh, the information is only 50% available. So you're saying as a risk taker, as an entrepreneur, one of the key learnings is that you need to know how to do proper decision making. But does that come over time or? Uh, it's, it's a part in process of learning, right? Uh, as an entrepreneurship itself, uh, it teaches you so many things uh, as an in the entrepreneurial journey. I think one of the most rewarding part of being an entrepreneur is not that one day you will have some fame, you will have some money, but uh, it's a it's a very good process to discover who you are. Mm. Like they say, right, that there's a huge difference between truth and satya. And I believe that uh, everybody should try to find their satya. 
and uh, satya takes time uh, of who you are and entrepreneur as an entrepreneur journey it's the best way to discover who truly you are and uh, that is what i'm going through right now and as an entrepreneur how do you deal with failure oh there's there's so many uh, which would come along your way uh, especially when you start taking risk uh, another thing sonia is that uh, you know i don't think so you can truly ever know in the foresight whether the risk which you are taking uh, will be worthwhile or not mm-hmm. you can see in the hindsight mm-hmm. for the decisions which you have taken whether they'll work out in your favor or not but in the foresight you will never know so mm-hmm. there are multiple decisions which we have taken uh, some of them worked out some of them didn't work out while running is matter i have had couple of other startups as well which didn't work the way i wanted them to work uh, but of course at that moment i did not know right mm-hmm. you're just taking risk uh, quitting my job and moving back to india worked out for mm-hmm. me but uh, you know on the four side you don't know whether it's going to work out or not it was a big decision at that moment mm-hmm. so um, only thing which i which i which i am by by these days uh, for all the learnings which you have had is that people will always know you for your last deed and you only need one success the very last success you can have multiple failures in the past but people will only and only recognize you for your last success mm. and hence uh, in the life span of 80 years let's say our work time is 50 years in this 50 years you have to just find one success and mm. you have all the 50 years to find that one success and that is what is going to define you mm. so hence uh, taking failures uh, on the chin is actually not a problem and one one another quote which uh, you know i really really love and by by i try to play chess these days okay so gary kasprov uh, you know quotes this beautifully and he says that one of the biggest things which he sees uh, people making mistakes while playing chess is they are trying to undo the last move they have made which is trying to undo the last mistake they have made mm-hmm. rather than seeing a new game after the mistake is made and hence uh, you know we see i i've seen I've that person myself too which is to be sulking a lot sulking a lot around the mistakes which you have made mm. you know just regretting those decisions and rather than just taking take that as an opportunity that you are who you are because of all the accumulation of your mistakes yeah and uh, you know i say this very often that success is actually a very lousy teacher <laughs> because once you have found the success the formula the teacher is failure yeah, yeah once you found a formula to succeed you don't want to change it yeah you want to just repeat because it's working mm. but while you're failing you want to try 100 new things and hence the learning comes so in your 15 year entrepreneurial journey right you started in 2008 what has your biggest learning been and something that you'd want to pass on to the new generation of entrepreneurs there are so many learnings as i said that first mm. is uh, you know just take failure to your chin and move on to the next one uh, it, during my initial part of my uh, you know journey of entrepreneurship I was blessed uh, to go through this experience uh, which I believe was one of the transformational period for me uh, which was uh, in year 2009 I met uh, Anil Kumble sir uh, playing one of the local matches in Bangalore now this guy is in his prime in year 2009 he's playing for India right yet I see him play a local match in Bangalore so I walk up to him and I say sir I, I don't know if he would even remember this or not but i walk up to him and say sir why are you playing a regular match right mm-hmm. you're like mr anil kumble yeah. who took 10 wickets uh, you know for india and pakistan watch uh, pakistan match and he said that prashant uh, in any international match uh, if i'm hit it for fours and sixes and do not take any wicket nobody blinks an eye mm-hmm. you know it's expected that some matches you will do well some matches you will not do well yeah but in this local match i cannot afford to not to take a wicket and or be bashed by fours or sixes so this is a way by which i keep pressure on myself to continue to perform that pressure does not exist on him on international matches mm. but on a local match mm. and that was an immense amount of learning for me to never be complacent yes no matter what you have achieved where you are you always have to innovate and find new ways to, to basically stay relevant. to stay relevant mm. um, so you know just never be complacent never take success too seriously you don't know what and never of, take it for granted also never i guess never take it for granted yeah. too wow Maybe. that's actually a lovely story i mean thank you for sharing that with us you know it'll it'll stay with me um, so i mean uh, i noticed that even in your performance right in your company's performance is my trip um it took a long time for you to actually catapult to new highs i mean yeah. for the first few years you were stuck in that range of i think 
100 crores 100 200 crores for many years for and many it's years. just recently that you've started doing annual turnover of around 4 5 maybe 500 crores um is is that a normal course of action in every entrepreneurship journey that the first 5 6 7 8 years are really tough and then there comes a turning point or is it different for different people well i believe that uh it might be different for different companies uh since we were a bootstrap company never raised any capital we only put in 15 lakh rupees of our own money in the first 5 years sonia so for us uh, maybe we didn't have enough muscle power to grow very rapidly in the mm-hmm. initial part as you rightly said from 2011 till 2016 our growth was very meager mm-hmm. uh, we were just purely surviving during those times uh if if we had some money at that moment maybe our growth would have come slightly better and faster during those days but i'm still glad that it did not happen that way because mm-hmm. it created a different culture in our company mm-hmm. now one of the biggest reasons which i believe is my trip has done really well without ever raising any money is because we have a very different internal culture which cannot be copied mm-hmm. you know your moats are people assume that moats are usually in your product mm-hmm. i i really believe that product can never be a moat because it can easily be copied by anybody your moat can always be your internal operations your internal culture which cannot be copied mm. for example at isma trip now imagine our company in year 2012 13 uh barely have any bank account but we are growing you know mm. thankfully by providing better services to the customers we are growing by not charging convenience fees uh, you know we are getting customers and by providing better services we are growing decently 15 20% per annum but in those days since we don't have money we need to hire product managers we need to hire quality assurance guys we need to hire technology people right all these people now how do we afford we can't afford these, these people yeah. especially since market is paying them 2 lakh rupees per month 3 lakh rupees per month right so what did we do um, and it's not that we were so smart at that moment we just did whatever best we could know at that moment so we had about 20 odd people in our call center team mm. and we decided to hire few bunch of people and train them to do all these things mm. so the ones who are high performing in their call center uh you know we train them to be operation guy we train them to be you know sales person we train them to be marketing people we train them to be product people in fact one of the persons uh you know who joined our call center in year 2010 right now is head of our, our IT her name is karishma she's head of our it right now wow so people even learn coding <laughs> during the process uh, so this is the best we we could do another thing which worked really well in our favor was that among all the otas we were the only ones uh, who chose to run our own call center everybody else has outsourced their call center mm. now we really believe that you know even though this entire product is a technology driven product but the soul of our company is service you know we are in tourism space right after all so it's a service and if you really believe that the soul of your business is service you will never outsource it but you know there's a certain degree of brand building as well that has worked for you right i mean is my trip has now become a household name and uh, as you said you started as a bootstrap founder did not raise any money and now you're the second largest travel company in india um how did you build that brand i mean what was the hack there well the biggest hack i would say is the patience uh it just took a lot of time for people to recognize uh, especially since we are not doing advertisements right uh people to recognize that uh, there is a company out there which is not charging convenience fees last quarter we started charging convenience fees on some sectors but otherwise all this uh, for the last 15 years we did not charge convenience fees to people we provided better service quicker service by running our own call center uh led us to have very high repeat transaction rate our repeat transaction rate is 93% wow so that allowed us to not to be uh very dependent on marketing since mm-hmm. there is a lot of repeat transactions which are happening and that led us to be profitable and profitability allowed us to not charge convenience fees so this is the virtuous circle in which we were growing and um, i i also believe that it it it's blessing in disguise that we did not have money to spend money on marketing at that moment it's a blessing in disguise uh so for example let's say if i go on tv i show tv advertisement saying i don't charge convenience fees mm. as a customer what would you think you would think kuch aur charge karoga mm. right as a customer that's what yeah. you would think if he's coming to out to market it if you're marketing then, yeah. kuch aur charge karoga mm. if he's not charging convenience fees that's how you would take and maybe you will not take his matter that seriously yeah. but if your friend comes and tells you yaar his matter is better doesn't charge convenience fees ek call mein phone utha lete hain mm-hmm. he doesn't have any agenda right yeah he's telling you probably the truth and hence uh, growing by a word of mouth actually is very high roi and 
keeps uh, you know keep you know that is probably why our repeat transaction rate is 93% mm. because we primarily grew via word of mouth and hence i believe that uh, not having money was actually a good problem uh, for us at that moment so you are have been growing at a very fast pace i mean last year your uh, gross booking revenues i think doubled and you were speaking to us a few quarters ago where you said that you hope to do a 50% growth year after year mm -hmm. on this base right mm -hmm. uh, what gives you that confidence is it is it the external environment the way travel has picked up in a big way what else no first and foremost of course uh, is the external environment um, I don't think so. There is any country in the world except for India which can claim that hundred new airports are going to be built in the next decade, right? That's India for you, and uh, hence because of this, uh, last to last year there were one twenty million passengers who flew. Ten years ahead, it's going to be three sixty million passengers. Mm -hmm. So when the industry itself is growing at fifteen sixteen percent CAGR basis, we ought to grow by at least two three times more than that as a growing company we are. so that definitely gives us a lot of confidence and the second thing is uh, you know so there are two kinds of e-commerce sonia one is basically where there's a physical product which is required and the second is digital good right mm -hmm. for example any e-commerce company where you're sending the package or where you're delivering the food there's a physical product which is required which is to be delivered thankfully we are in an industry where no product needs to be delivered i can just send a whatsapp message or an email uh, a ticket copy and the job is done right mm -hmm. So, as a digital good company, India doesn't need to be the only place where I I could work. You know, being one of the most efficient OTAs in India, I could serve people who are living in Middle East. Mm. I could serve people who are living in US or Europe. And imagine if I'm the most efficient OT in India, if I start serving people living in these developed nations where they are currently served by the companies which are existing out of those developed nations, imagine the kind of efficiency I have. Mm. So. for that reason we have started ismatrip.ae mm. serving middle east ismatrip.uk serving europe and soon we'll be starting ismatrip.us serving people in us and uh by continuing to run the same lean operations and technology out of india i'm very very sure we are going to see a tremendous amount of growth so you started by saying that the job of an entrepreneur is to look 10 years into the future right what do you see as the future of the travel industry Oh, I have a lot of hot takes around this. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, I'm waiting to hear them. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, and this is purely what I think will be right. Uh, for example, I believe that a lot of intra-city travel will go away in next ten years. In the sense where it's not going to be the primary mode is not going to be the vehicle. The primary mode is going to be air taxis. I believe that the and it's going to become as cheap because it can be autonomous see roads cannot be autonomous at least in india Why you, not? you 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 need to have a driver there's so much of chaos yeah, yeah. on the road right mm. but whenever there's a new infrastructure which comes in and air is a new infrastructure mm. air is abundantly available right now and nobody is using air mode of transportation except for the flights which are way above right which are at very high altitude but all these altitude between let's say 1000 feet to 10000 feet is clear it's mm. abundantly available you know i'm waiting for air taxis especially in bombay <laughs> i i can't fed up of the traffic uh, <laughs> when is it coming tell me now <laughs> uh, i i really believe it's 5 years ahead it's just 5 years ahead and especially it will be cheaper because it doesn't need to be driven by a pilot since it's all open it's all open space it can be done in a very good way where gdss can be deployed from the beginning itself where you don't need to have a pilot to drive it around you so you, who's going to drive there it's taxi? just going to be autonomous it, oh. you know you would just feed in your location it's going to land on the terrace of place where you want to go but uh, this has been in the works for a very long time it's just something that is not picked up right i i don't think so it has been there for a long time but i'll tell you one problem which needs to be solved to be, for this to happen so there's a problem called as traveling salesman's problem okay which this world is grappling with right now okay first wait 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 let's talk about this this is important okay so you're saying that air taxis are going to be a thing of the future that's a very near future in the next 5 years mm -hmm. where all of us are going to be using the skies in order to move from one place to another it's within a city it's going to be cheaper than uber within a be, city within a city not outside the city but within a city okay tell me more so that's that's number one i think that's uh, that's one thing which i'm really looking forward uh, for to happen the second thing which i'm looking forward to see is basically related to less usage of hotel rooms uh the way i see uh right now if i have to travel to let's say chandigarh uh from bombay to chandigarh how is how is that happening if there's no direct flight to chandigarh from bombay i land up in delhi and from delhi basically i stay at one night in delhi uh at the 
nearby airport hotel and then next day i take a car to chandigarh right now once we have solved this traveling salesman's problem which i will talk about mm-hmm. later i will go from bombay to delhi i will land in delhi but then at delhi at the airport there will be an autonomous pod which will come and greet me mm-hmm. and in this pod there's just going to be a bed there's going to be a coffee table and no driver inside but that bot knows that my final destination is my house in panchkula mm-hmm. so i'm just going to go uh, you know change my dress change, yeah. and you know get in my bed comfortably and overnight uh, that pod will take me uh, to 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 my room to my hotel, uh, to my home oh. and that is that is where i think the world is going to move to it's like an rv basically like it's, a- it's an rv which is self driving which is just uh, it will go and plug itself whenever it's discharged it's just going to charge by itself Wow. And this is where I think uh, the world is going to head towards. But do you think time. India is going to be a little late in the game, like it generally is with a lot India, of this technology? India air will be faster. Uh, India road will be later. So my bet of having air taxi is five years, while having autonomous pod pod is ten years, okay. because the road infrastructure is already laid out. That mm-hmm. cannot be changed. But air infrastructure is not laid yet, okay. and India can actually be the leader. in this particular space so why have we not seen air taxis yet where does the challenge lie the cha- the challenge lies between multiple parties entrepreneurs governments aviation ministers all to collaborate together and create an infrastructure around it mm. i think that is where technology is solved technology mm. is not a problem anymore mm. it's just that the infrastructure needs to be laid out where and government is doing great job at it like recently government has created uh you know a space where anything which is less than 300 kgs as a payload uh can use air space so there is a there's a draft which is put in put on the table right now and government is working in this direction and that is why i'm actually actually extremely excited so uh you're saying in the next 5 years we're going to see air taxis where i can travel from one place in the city to another by using an an, an aircraft correct which will be self driving which will be wow that mm. seems bizarre right now but i'm sure it's just a matter of time mm. and you're saying travel pods are the other thing that's going to be uh, you Correct. know uh, that is why fruition. i said it's a hot take <laughs> <laughs> but you're talking about the salesman issue so uh, right now uh, in order to find the most efficient way to go from one place to other and then from that place to the third place which is what the ubers of the world are doing right but this is not the most efficient way now in order to have the air taxis do it most efficiently and hence be cost efficient there's a problem traveling salesman's problem mm-hmm. which is not solved yet but this problem is going to be solved using quantum computing which is just around the edge of the corner okay. at this moment so i believe that the traveling salesman's problem will be cracked in the next 2 to 3 years time which will become a infrastructure layer uh, which will enable so uh, what exactly is this traveling salesman problem so for example you know bees knows the best on how to go from one flower to the other flower to the third flower so that with minimizing their flight time they can con- they can extract the most amount of honey mm. as humans we don't know how to arrange if we have to go to 10 different destinations we have we still do not know exactly in which order we have to go drive okay uh, so yeah. everything is exp- uh, approximation and heuristics mm. but it's not solved accurately um, and this problem uh, should be solved using quantum computing as we know okay so quantum computing generative ai all of these are of course things that we are talking about a lot more mm. uh, do you think even in the travel industry is going to be the future and if yes what does that mean for jobs for employees how much of the uh, work staff is going to get cut down how much of the costs are going to go down <laughs> so this is this is a problem which we face in every decade you know back in times i remember you know hearing about this in 1980s uh, when cal- calculator was invented a lot of maths professors went on strike that what are we going to do now because at that moment they used to teach calculating mm. to people right but did the jobs of uh, maths professors or teacher diminish after coming of calculator the answer is no mm. they just started solving higher level problems they just started teaching higher level problems and i also believe that is what is going to happen with generative ai or you know quantum computing which is coming you know we as humans would start grappling with higher level problems rather than the lower level problems but to assume that the jobs will go away is only a matter of laughter for me it's mm-hmm. just going to the jobs are going to shift from one level problem to the other level problem mm-hmm. but uh, i don't think so as a job loss or as a as a motivation to work 
will end, it will anyways diminish you know talking about jobs i mean this industry the startup world is facing so much by way of job losses right now what's your take on that do you think it's just a phase see uh, it it is a cyclical in nature it happens after every few years uh, first there is uh, abundance of money and whenever there is an abundance of money uh, more jobs get created uh, they might be not as efficient uh, you know and hence company over employ over hire are uh, doing those times and whenever there is a scarcity of money uh, which is the period we are going through right now and in the scarcity of money usually companies start to become more efficient mm. during those times mm. so i believe this is just cyclical in nature and there is nothing new which we are seeing at the moment which hasn't happened before okay so this funding winter that startups are facing in india i mean it is going to go on for a bit because there are like the other day i was speaking to a founder who said you know this sort of an apocalyptic situation is for startups especially in the us i don't know about indian founders as much but he was talking more about the us startup space and how things are funding is really drying up I right now i may not describe this as apocalyptic mm. uh you know i think yes uh, there is a funding winter which is going on which might be slightly more harsher mm. than the previous times hey but as a bootstrap founder uh, i find that you know as a company of ours we have always seen our company grow faster whenever there is a scarcity of money uh for our competitors mm. uh, since uh, we never raised money till today uh, i find myself to be in a better position whenever there is a scarcity of money because then actually it's a it's a match of an equal right mm. it's not that they are coming with full pockets and then they are throwing their punches uh it's an equal competition at this moment mm. and uh, we have always seen ourselves grow a little bit faster whenever and i i speak for most bootstrap founders by the way if india has 1 lakh companies uh, as a startup i believe only few maybe few thousands have raised money remaining all are bootstrap yeah. so majority of indian startups are actually bootstrap yeah. it's just that the glory is mostly given to the ones who have raised 50 million dollars 100 million dollars no i think also for bootstrap founders to grow their business exponentially is rare right although all, most are bootstrap that, that is true that yeah. is true most are bootstrap it's extremely rare for a bootstrap companies as you like to become a unicorn to become a unicorn yeah. it's it's very rare uh, and uh, i think that there there are times where you may not even want to do it bootstrap mm. a lot of money wherever in the business is where a lot of r&d is required mm. it's better to take the money because it's a very risky capital in mm. that sense mm. uh if if it's a commodity business like ours you know selling flights bus train hotels it's a commodity business mm. and in a commodity business all you have to do is be efficient mm. you don't have to create newer things you have mm. to just be efficient compared to all of your competitors mm. and eventually just by being efficient for a really long period of time you will eventually win and that is the mantra which we played for so uh being a rare breed right a bootstrapped unicorn founder if you had to do things differently uh would you change anything at all in your journey oh uh, it's very difficult to say uh which particular decision whether bad or good in fact more wrong decisions uh did not help us it's very difficult to say that because the learning which you derive from that uh wrong decision uh probably was used somewhere else mm -hmm. uh outside uh for example in the first few months of running ease my trip uh there was a credit card fraud which happened mm -hmm. uh in at ease my trip now that credit card fraud uh you know we lost about 26 lakhs of money which was borrowed money also mm -hmm. so you know i don't think so we would have changed anything uh knowing at least uh, the outcome is coming all right so knowing everything I don't think so I would change anything in the journey. You wouldn't. Probably not. Okay, okay. Well, that's good. I mean, you don't need to change anything. You've had such a great journey. <laughs> But you know, just before we wrap up a couple of things, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what happened with the whole Maldives issue. I mean, your take on that. <laughs> I was hoping uh... <laughs> <laughs> No, but um just to understand what motivated you to make that move during the whole Maldives controversy and uh was it I mean, some people say it was purely for PR, some people say it was for optics. Mm. What's your view? Uh, see Sonia, uh, you have to act, uh, see through who we are as a company and uh, what kind of decisions we have taken in the past to see a to take a holistic view. Um, year 2020 during COVID uh, times, you know, I'm just sharing one example of how quickly we decide and uh, what are what is our basic principles in deciding. So during lockdown times, uh, you know, all the flights were cancelled, right? and uh, a lot of people wanted refund for their money but airlines and uh, hotels they were cash starved at that moment and hence 
refer to its own sweet time mm-hmm. now we as an ota and i'm speaking for all of us we mm-hmm. as an ota cannot provide you money unless we get it back from the principal right correct so hence um, we were also stuck but then is my trip had uh, accumulated about 200 crores of profit mm-hmm. from the last 13 years of our existence mm-hmm. right now at that moment uh, this was uh, may 2020 mm-hmm. uh, no actually even slightly before i think early may 2020 we decided uh, we are three brothers and you know we are sitting on the board uh, since there was no external investor there was nobody else on the board at that moment we decided that hey i mean we have 200 crores lying in our bank account and if everything turns all right we will get this money back so why don't we give refund to people using the money which is lying in our bank mm. and wait it out for the airlines to give that money back to us hoping that none of the airlines or hotels would die mm. if they die we would lose our money right yeah uh, we would lose the money which we have accumulated over the period of time but then we went ahead and we gave 130 crores in refund to public from our cash reserve in year 2020 and that became a pivotal moment for our company because after pandemic we immediately jumped from being third largest to the second largest mm. that that became one of the monumental moments for our company uh, you know there was a huge uproar on social media where people were saying that uh, my friend got money from is my trip why am i not getting money from you oh wow so, okay so that decision worked well for you that but decision uh, it's not that that decision worked well for us it was just that we we were thinking people first yeah. at that particular moment mm. and uh, that allowed us to take that decision okay. uh, coming to the question but, which you uh, no let me rephrase the question right hand on heart do you think that the decision to cancel flights to maldives was uh, a bit of an emotional decision rather was, than a business it, decision it was it was uh, we did not know how it will pan out i'll explain you the rationale so about at 1 am at night we decided that we will cancel the flights to maldives right mm. now how did that decision happen it was a very simple thought process that of course there is good amount of business uh, which we were doing with maldives in the mm. past right um and it was a substantial amount i i cannot share the number we are in a uh, you know this period uh, what's that period silent called period. silent period yeah. we are in a silent period right now i may not be able to disclose the number but it was a very hand, uh, handsome amount of money and we we knew that if we are going to you know not work with maldives it has to be for a substantial period of time till mm. the normalcy comes back between both the countries mm. so we knew that we are letting go of a very substantial amount of business uh, not knowing what all repercussions can happen see in the world we live in we know that there are always two sides of the coins mm. so we did not know firstly we are losing business and secondly we will surely be alienating bunch of people we knew so, that so what motivated you to take that decision see just read just seeing an image of a uh, maldivian president wearing mm. india out t-shirt mm. now turn the table imagine our pm is wearing a t-shirt says maldives out mm. would any self respecting maldivian come and spend their money in this country it is coming right from the top mm. it is not bunch of few ministers mm. who are sitting and mm. it has been happening for the last 10 years uh, mm. they they got into the power in november 2023 mm. uh saying india out is a uh, you know their policy they they have been pro china so whatever decisions they are taking related to china right now it was all supposed to happen anyways hmm. it's not that it happened because we promoted lakshwadeep yeah. it would be very silly for people to think that because we promoted lakshwadeep they are saying india out no hmm. it was happening since last 10 years hmm. so it was an emotional decision not knowing where it would turn uh, we we took that call but thankfully it paid off do emotional decisions generally work out compared to say what people think i'm not sure whether uh, emotional decisions usually work out or not but as long as you are putting nation above you you are putting your people above you your countrymen above you i think usually people can see through you mm-hmm. and people can see through your intentions i'll give you another example uh, which we did and this actually solidified our thought process that people usually can see through uh, what you are what why you taking a decision for mm-hmm. example during second covid uh, wave lockdown you know uh, we lost a lot of people right mm-hmm. we all did um, as a country we suffered uh, tremendously during those times but after the second lockdown was over we found people to be extremely hesitant to travel mm-hmm. uh, this was in the month of august 2021 where second uh, covid wave was kind of no over at that moment isma trip started this policy where all you have to do is upload a doctor's prescription that you had some problem and we will give you full money back at that moment i think i remember that i remember we, that yeah we started this and people thought it was foolish uh, we were a listed company by then and mm. we got a lot of brickbat 
uh, from the market saying that you know we all know it's so easy for people to procure hundred rupees prescription and upload and get three thousand rupees entire three thousand rupees back and you'll be you'll be taking a loss of three thousand rupees yeah. of cancellation of flight ticket uh, while people just have to upload hundred rupees right uh, we still stood uh, on our decision and till today that policy exists wow. because people did not misuse it. Okay. People did not misuse it. That gave us the confidence that people can see through your intention that, hey, if I'm trying to do good for people, they might, they should also not misuse it. Yes. And if it's been two and a half years, that policy still exists. So you would know that it is not bringing losses to the company. Mm -hmm. That is why that policy still today exists. So these are the learnings which we have had in our past and that gave us confidence to do whatever we felt is right for the country. And then the business will obviously succeed because we are doing something right for the country. Absolutely. And this, these are really pearls of wisdom that I'm, I'm sure our viewers are going to take away as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, we were talking about, you know, Maldives and I mean, Lakshadweep and a lot of the other now religious tourism is picking up in a big way with the success of Ayodhya, the opening mm. of the Ram Temple. Uh, do you think that is going to be the next big wave of tourism in India? Because I was reading the numbers, right? Last year, Kashi Vishwanath uh, Temple had over seven and a half crore visitors in a year I mean yeah, that yeah. is I think multifold compared to what we see in a Goa for example and imagine the same kind of number adding to Ayodhya from almost nil to seven and a half crores imagine the kind of money it will move within the country as economy and the kind of jobs it will create the kind of infrastructure it will create so I'm, I'm actually really thankful uh, for, for the government to actually create such places of excellence for our country this could be our Vatican city mm -hmm. for that moment you know it need not be just an Indian or uh, Hindu tourism space, right? It could be a Vatican City where we all go yeah. to see the and be awe inspired yeah. by the grandeur of the place. So mm -hmm. I really hope that uh, India has always been a hub for, you know, the culture and uh, spirituality for the world. And if India could create five, six such monumental places where people from across the globe can come and experience our spirituality, our history, this would be a great impetus to the country. And I believe that that is in the, I mean, the direction is in the right sense. Okay. And where are we going to see Is My Trip five years, 10 years from now? Are you guys going to be the, you know, at the forefront of the, uh, what did you call that? The um, taxis? Uh, yeah, the flying taxis. The flying taxis. taxis. Okay. So are we going to see like Is My Trip at the forefront of flying taxis? Uh, we hope so. Since uh, that is what we believe is the future is, uh, of course, we are taking some baby steps mm -hmm. in that direction uh, without quoting anything right now. Uh, but there are some baby steps which we are taking to see if we can be participant in creating such infrastructure. Okay, Prashant, it was great speaking to you. I mean, you know, we learned a lot and uh, I learned a lot about, a lot from your journey as well. All you, three of you brothers, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you're, you know how, how they say, um, I am sure there was something in that which, which really worked well uh, all three of you with your entrepreneurial journey so all the best and thank you so so much for joining us on the show Pleasure is all man Sonia thank you Thank you for watching CNBC TV 18 for all the latest news and updates do follow us on our social media platforms